is here a little on the early side. The others sometimes are a little later getting here. But we'll go from current slide. Let me also turn on the projector. I forgot to do that. Oh, there is an announcement, and I hope I remembered to bring it. I've been working on this other stuff, so let's see if it's here somewhere. It's supposed to be. Okay, the announcement, and I wish everybody else was here because I'll probably need to repeat it every time someone comes in. Uh, you probably have received at least two e emails about this, but you may not realize it. Have you? About student course evaluations? Fantastic. Okay, so have you done them before? I've always done them. You've always. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, for those who aren't here, uh, check your emails. There's probably two of them out there at least. The first one may say Lawson State Fall 2018 surveys have opened. That was the wrong title, subject line, but the right email. They just used an old email but forgot to change the subject line. Uh, it's summer 2019 t term surveys are available, and it tells you how to access them. There's a link there you can go to. Click on the link. It takes you right there. It tells you how to... Um, Log on. Your seven studio ID number is your log on, and your eight digit birth date is your password. And the eight digits are the four digits of the year. For me, that would be 1951. None of you will be that old. Uh, the next two are the month of your birth, which for me would be 01 for January, and then the last two would be zero, your birth date, and that would be for me 07, whatever yours happens to be will be the last two digits there. And then you'll go right to the surveys, and how long did it take you to do them? Not long. Not long at all. I've heard students say five minutes or less. Uh, one said that, that uh, he wrote a few comments, so he wrote, took him a little longer. Yeah. So, Did you have any additional ones to do, like food service or, or maintenance? Okay. In fall and spring, they sometimes attach others to them, but I guess in the summer they just do it. Yeah, so that's just one to do. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, for those not here, if you're listening to this, please do the student course evaluation. All right. Last time, any questions on anything up till now? Okay. Last time we were talking about, just got started on Chapter 16, Wave Motions and Sound. Right now we're still in the wave motion part. And, uh, goodness, my nose itches. We had talked about transverse waves in which the motion is perpendicular to the direction of the wave. The, the energy, let's see, how do I say that? The force that creates the wave is perpendicular to the propagation of the wave. Like when you raise up a uh, hose and swing it down and that snake goes across the yard, okay? Um, the second form is, is uh, longitudinal waves, and that's what a picture of this is. This is a spring-type action, and it can be others as well. And a spring-type action, well, let me give you a little bit of the definitions first. Um, uh, when the particle motion is along the direction of wave travel, this is longitudinal. Let me get my pen. If I can find it, here it is. Okay. Okay, a longitudinal is when the uh, particle motion is along the direction of wave travel. Particle motion in direction of wave motion. Okay, and remember a transverse wave, the particle motion is perpendicular to the direction of the wave motion. This one's uh, in the direction, parallel to the wave motion. 
Now here's what this deal is here. You're here holding the spring, uh, stretched out a little bit, and then you take your hand and compress the spring and pull it back. Well, when you compress the spring, that compression leaves here, and when you pull back, then you have what they call a rarefaction. So you have, and that actually travels down the wing, the spring. Here, a little bit later it's here, a little bit later it's here. The rarefaction where you pull back is here. They don't show that very well here, but the this is the compression, there's the rarefaction. And again, they don't show the rarefaction very well. But that's the motion is in this direction and the wave is in that direction. Okay? They're both in the same direction. Whereas transverse, the motion is like this, but the wave, the the action is like this, and the wave motion is like that. Okay? Like I do up and down, but the snake goes across the yard in that direction. Okay. Yeah. Here, I do this, and the motion is that way. Okay, that's a, a longitudinal wave. Okay. Now, uh, this one is a little... Ah, here she is. I knew you were usually here fairly early. So the bottom half of the alphabet is here. The top half is still missing. So we hope they'll show up. Uh, and can't remember now, did I announce this last time about the student course evaluations? I did, okay. So you all heard it. I couldn't remember what time I, when I actually printed the email. And if I had told you all not to remember to do the student course evaluation. All right. Um, now, when you have a transverse wave, the wavelength is a lot easier to talk about, okay? A longitudinal wave is a little harder to visualize. This is just a single wave, so you don't really have a wavelength. But if you had done this regularly, like this, back and forth, then if you had a wave here and a wave there, and you find the equal position, either the first compression, the middle of the compression, the last, whatever it is, you pick the, the same place, and that would be your wavelength then. Easier to see when it's a transverse wave, because you have a peak and a trough. Pick the peak or pick the trough or something and measure peak to peak or trough to trough. This one's a little harder to measure, okay? Um, it's the minimum distance between particles that have the same displacement and moving in the same direction. So the, um, let's see if there's going to be a better slide. Yeah, that slide will describe it better. So we'll wait on that. Uh, in fact, let's go to it. That's your longitudinal wave of, of a spring. That's not the only kind. Sound is a longitudinal wave. It's in the same direction. I'm making vibrations that move from me to your ear. The vibrations are that way. The wave is that way. Okay? That's a longitudinal wave. They're also sometimes called pressure waves. Okay? So now let's move to the concept of wavelength. Okay? And that's the next highlighted uh, word in your text. The wavelength is the minimum distance between particles that have the same displacement and are moving in the same direction. So this is a symbol for it, lambda, and this is wavelength. Think of length, L, lambda, L. That's the Greek symbol for L, lambda. Okay, it starts with L. Okay, it's the minimum distance Uh, between particles that uh, have the same displacement and are moving in the same direction.
Okay, that's a sort of wordy definition. Let me point it out to you and show you what they mean. Okay, obviously, crest to crest, they have the same displacement and they're moving in the same direction. Here, they've gone up and they're just about to move down, so those are same thing, that's lambda. Okay, you don't have to measure crest to crest. Another easy place would be trough to trough. Again, same displacement, moving in the same direction. Or the equilibrium position. Now, the equilibrium pressure is a little tougher because you see there's another place here where it's in the same location, same uh, moving, in, uh, has the same displacement, but this one is moving down, this one's moving up. That's not a wavelength. You have to go over here to where it's the same displacement, but moving in the same direction. So that would make it your wavelength there. You could do it from this point here to that point there. Not to this point, because they're moving in different directions. Here, they're same displacement, moving in the same direction. So any of those would be a wavelength. And they're all the same. This is the wavelength, lambda. All those are lambdas. It's the minimum distance between particles that have the same displacement moving in the same direction. Okay, straight out of the book on page, uh, bottom of page 426. Now, I was telling Sharon earlier, I forgot to bring my reading glasses today, so I'm having to sort of squint at the book to, to make out. It's actually far easier to read from a distance, but then the words get so small I can't read them, so it's a mess up there. All right, now, wavelength is a length measured in meters, millimeters, centimeters, inches, miles, furlongs, whatever. It's a length, lambda, okay? Now, period is a time, okay? The period is a time for a single wave to pass a single point. So if the wave is moving in this direction, and you start your clock right there, by the time this peak gets over to here, that time is your period, okay? Or the other way to look at it, the time it takes to get from here to there, okay? So wavelength is the length of that. The period is the time of that, okay? The period is the time. Uh, time required for a single wave to pass a single point. Uh, period is the time for a single wave to pass a single point. A single point. So, if, if that longitudinal wave or transverse wave comes along, and you have a peak here, the time, and that goes down. By the time the next peak comes, if you had a stopwatch on it, that would be, at that point, by the time it goes down and up again, that would be the period. So period is a time. Whereas wavelength is a distance. Wavelength measured in a distance unit, inches, millimeters, whatever. Uh, period measured in a time unit. Seconds, usually. Okay? Now, here's another one. Frequency. Okay, frequency is the number of complete waves passing a given point per unit time. The number of complete waves passing a given point in a given time. Okay? Now let me give you a little hint here. Okay? The period and the frequency are related to each other. The period is the time for a single wave to pass a single point. The frequency is the number of waves to pass in a given time. 
So in other words, the period is the time per cycle or time per wave. The frequency is the number of cycles or complete cycles per unit time. So they're exactly reciprocals of each other. And that's an important formula here. And by the way, the, the symbol for period, wavelength is lambda, period is capital T, frequency is little f. And as I just said, the period is equal to 1 over the frequency, and the frequency is equal to 1 over the period. Oops, <laughs> I put P for period, T for period. Okay, so not only are my eyes crazy, but I can't write either. I've got to sneeze up. To her. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just didn't want to sneeze again, uncovered. Okay, let me go back. And I, because I can't see well, I can't see which one of these little icons I'm supposed to hit. Okay, that's the one. T is the period. That's a time, so the capital of T. Yes! Capital T. Now... Remember when we were talking about velocities and acceleration, little t was time. And little t is still time. Period is capital T. That is a specific time, the time for one wave to pass. Times per cycle, seconds per cycle, whereas the frequency is the number of cycles per second. So that would be 1 over the period. I mean, yeah, 1 over the period. So... Period is 1 over frequency. Frequency is 1 over period. Okay, the frequency, right here, the L, the yeah. frequency up on the bottom. Yeah, I just put that here to say that's the symbol for frequency. It has nothing to do with this lambda. It's just the symbol for frequency is oh, F. Oh, I'm yeah. trying to write the symbol. Yeah, it's just a symbol. So if period is 1 over frequency. Frequency is 1 over period. Think of this. Period is time, seconds per cycle, whereas frequency is cycles per second, okay? Um, uh, and by the way, they have a little mention here of Heinrich Hertz, and I was just reading a research paper done by one of the students in another class, uh, and she mentioned him in the paper, and it was interesting that we were going to talk about him today. Uh, they named the unit of frequency after him. So frequency is measured in, like I said, cycles per second. But you see, a cycle is a, a, a unit. It's just how many waves go in a second. So actually, they often call this a 1 over second or a second to the minus 1. That means it's 1 over second. But the common thing is Hertz, H-Z, named after Heinrich Hertz. Now, there was another physicist named, whose last name was Henry. He'd already used the capital H, or they used the capital H to name the unit for inductance after him. Is that right? Inductance, yeah. Uh, and uh, so they couldn't say Hertz was H, so they made H-Z because... First and last letter in his name, Hertz, Heinrich Hertz. Now, <clears throat> a Hertz, one Hertz is one per second, one cycle per second, okay? Most things are not that slow of a cycle. When you're talking about frequencies, uh, higher frequencies are sometimes in kilohertz, like your AM radio. You'll see those are sometimes something like 104 kilohertz, cycles per second. That's a lot. But that ain't nothing compared to the higher frequency, like your uh, television or, or FM radio, that's in megahertz, which is not thousands of cycles per second, but millions of cycles per second. So... Pick your favorite radio station, that number that goes in front of it. That is usually the number of 
megahertz. If his FM station is megahertz, um, what is one of your favorite stations? Do you have one? AM. A oh, AM. What is it? Um, 600. 600. That's kilohertz. Okay. If you have a favorite FM station, that might be, my wife likes to listen to, I think it's 96.5 megahertz. That's uh, Magic 96, or, yeah, Magic, Magic 96. It's 96.5 megahertz. But there are other frequencies that are as high as gigahertz, okay? Really, really high frequency. That would be things like uh, really harmful radiation, like gamma radiation would be in gigahertz. Uh, radar and microwaves are measured in gigahertz. Uh, frequency of FM is megahertz, and AM frequency is quite often kilohertz. Okay. <clears throat> so I've already given the formula, and let's see if they give it again. No, that's coming up later. That frequency is 1 over period. Okay. Now here's another formula. Sorry about this. <laughs> From what we have here, a wavelength is a length, a frequency is a per second, so it should follow that the speed of a wave or velocity of a wave is equal to lambda times f, speed, uh, distance per second, or the other definition for it would be lambda, the length, divided by the period, which is the time period to make a cycle. So it's one wavelength divided by the time for a wavelength. So here are two formulas for velocity of a wave. Speed of a wave is lambda times the frequency or lambda divided by the period. Okay? It's called the propagation velocity of the wave. How fast is the wave moving? Uh, and those relationships apply to sound, water, light, and every sort of wave. Okay? So we're ready for example one. And I think we'll go to the white page. So if it's all right to delete this. Okay. Okay. Okay, it says find the velocity, which means I have to change my color again. I'm a chameleon. Okay, find the velocity, that's going to be V, that's the thing we're looking for, the unknown here, of a wave with a wavelength. What's the symbol for wavelength? Length, lambda, lambda, length. That's that Greek symbol there. Looks like a, a shepherd's crook with a foot. <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's crazy. Uh, velocity with a wavelength of 2.5 meters. Okay. And a frequency of 44 hertz. What's the symbol for frequency? F. And that's 44 hertz. Now, that's a very slow, low frequency. Okay. Uh, but can we figure the velocity? What is the relationship between... Velocity, wavelength, and frequency. Just had that formula. I think you were writing it. Ah, here's Haley. Okay. All right. So we're just missing Brianna. Hopefully she'll be making it in. She usually does. I guess she's missed once. Okay. And you know I know the equation for frequency. I mean velocity. Related to wavelength and frequency. Was it? Give it on that. Mm -hmm. 
Now just write it down. Velocity equal lambda divided by no, okay, I'm sorry, not divided by. It's divided by period or multiplied by frequency. Because frequ frequency is, let me rewrite it, okay. Whoa, wrong, 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 wrong. Okay. Okay, that's what I want. Uh, it's lambda times frequency, or F times lambda. Because frequency is per second. So this would be meters per second. And that's exactly what you get, 2.5 meters times 44. And rather than writing hertz, write it as a per second or one over second. So when you put those together, 2 times 44 would be uh, 88, and half of 44 would be 22. So 88 and 22 is... Uh, one z one one zero one one zero and that would be meters per second and that's so a so multiplied for 2.5 times um, 44 and then you have no 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 no, no. 2.5 times 44 does it all what i did since i didn't have a calculator i doubled 44 2 times 44 is 88, and then 0. 0.5 times 44 is half of 44 is 22. I added 88 and 22, and I got 110. See if your calculator agrees. I was doing it in my head. I didn't mean for you to have to do it that way. Has anyone done it? 2.5 times 44. 110. 110, I thought so. Meters per second. Meters over second. That's the velocity. And that's what they got in the book too. Now we're ready to talk about what they call, so let me, can I erase this? Or not just erase it, get out of it. Yay or nay? Okay. So let's discard that and go back to our other slide and move on to this one and go from current slide. All right. Waves have this feature, characteristic, that they superimpose. It's called the superposition of waves. Okay? Now what that means, the superposition of two of the two blue waves in A and B, they've got the colors wrong. And I, I don't know why they say blue. <laughs> it's the two sort of beige waves in A and B form the new blue wave in C uh, by adding their displacements, okay? It's C and D, by the way. So they got the color wrong in the book, and they got it color wrong on the slide as well. Okay, but it's still there. What you're doing, if you had two hoses there on the ground, and I did this one like this, and did the other one like this, you'd see the waves go down, and if you were able to add those, sometimes they add, sometimes they cancel out, Sometimes they subtract, and that would be the superposition of the two waves. Okay? Now, I can't quite figure out what they're talking about with the location one here. They have two bars and say location one. Uh, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but I, I yeah, I, I see what that one is. I don't see what the second bar is. But here's what they're saying, okay? You're adding the waves at the top. So starting off, this wave's at zero, that wave's at zero, the sum's going to be at zero, right? And then they both go up, so this one goes up this much, this one goes up a little bit less, 
So you add those two and it goes up to here. Okay? And then this one reaches its peak. That one isn't quite at its peak. And somewhere between the time this is leaving its peak and this is still going to its peak, this one, the superimposed one, adds to be the maximum. Okay? And then, when this one's down at zero, this one is right around there. So sure enough, the blue wave is right there. Where this one is zero, the blue wave crosses the other way, because this is zero plus that. And then they're both decreasing from that point on, so the blue wave is decreasing uh, until it gets down here, and here this wave is up a little bit, this is down further, so this one's slightly negative. Right here, this one, the distance up from this one is exactly equal to the distance down there, so the sum is zero. Now here they cross at zero, so then the blue wave has to be at zero as well, okay? So you see this kind of pattern going on. It's a wave. Its wavelength is from here to here because that point to that point's the same, this point to this point's the same, that point to that point's the same. So you've created a new wave with a new wavelength, okay? Here you have a wavelength of this, here you have a wavelength of that, and here you have a wavelength of this which is different from either one of them, kind of in between the two, okay? Now, where they wipe each other out, that's called, okay, where they add to each other, that's called constructive interference, and when one's up here and the other one's down here, they go to zero, so that's destructive interference, right there, okay? A is a point of constructive interference, B is a point of destructive interference, okay? and you have periods of that. So you have periods of maximum constructive, and this is maximum constructive negatively, and this is destructive a little bit in here, because this is smaller than either one of those waves were, because they're taking away from each other. This is what we mean by superposition of two waves. Two gray waves, or tan waves, from A and B to form the new blue wave in C and D. I don't know why they didn't correct their colors. So I'm going to call the, oh, I've got to change my pen back. I can't get my pen to come back. Come on back, pen. There you are. Uh, okay. So I'm going to change this to tan wave to form a new blue wave in C and D. Okay. Just say had it wrong. All right, now, that's all they're going to say now about superposition of waves, okay? Now, I'm just going to hazard a guess here because I've never done sonography, but I bet you a lot of the imaging that you will be doing in your sonography comes from where the waves are constructively interfering or destructively interfering. This is how you get your image to come out, or this is at least part of it. Now, there's another thing called a standing wave, uh, and this isn't quite your standing wave yet, uh, but it's beginning to be, okay? Now, here's something interesting that happens. When you do a transverse wave down a thing, but now the hose isn't left hanging down there. It's fixed at one end, or the wire, or whatever you're doing. Okay? And you do an incident wave, and the wave moves down the stream until it gets here. When it hits down here, it can't move because that's fixed. So what the energy does is then reverses and reflects this way, but upside down. Okay? And that's your reflective wave going back that way. Okay? Now... <clears throat> Do any of you play a guitar? No. Have you ever seen anyone play a guitar? Okay, you know what they do? They put their fingers over the frets to make new notes. Well, what they're doing are they're putting their fingers right there and stopping the wave right there. But then they're strumming the guitar so the wave can only go to where their finger is. Right? And then it bounces back. Well, ultimately, it forms what we call 
a standing wave. And here's what a standing wave is. Uh, here's the first half of a wavelength, okay? The string is generated by increasing the frequency of vibration. Exactly half a wavelength. When you make it one wavelength, then you go down one, it bounces and comes back one, and you have formed what they call a standing wave. This point right here never moves because they're always inter you know, constructively interfering to right there. But these are your maximum. That's constructive interference there, destructive interference there. That's a one wavelength standing wave. This is one and a half wavelength. There's one wavelength and there's another. And then when it bounces back, it, you know, it goes back. So it actually came down this way, bounced back this way. These points never move as does that one or the one at the top. Okay? Actually, on the guitar, the one at the bottom, that's this one here. That's fixed anyway. Where he puts his finger at the top, that's the one up there. Okay? And makes different waves. This is a two wavelength standing wave. Here the wave comes down, there's one wave, two waves, okay? And it bounces back one wave, two waves. Now, if you don't quite get your finger right and it's not quite doing correctly, you might get, you know, one of those notes that doesn't really ring true, okay? Uh, then you would have a messed up note. But most of the time these will be nice, beautiful, smooth, even notes. So if you have your guitar out of tune, it's going to sound terrible, okay? But if it's in tune, then you form these waves that have these special characteristics. Uh, so don't sweat that too much. We're not going to do too much with that, okay? Now, when you're talking about standing waves, you have another length. Your wavelength is one length, and when your length between, say, the frets, okay, or whatever, uh, is one half wavelength, you get this. This is the length L. These are the lambda wavelength lengths, uh, and here the the lambda is equal to L. Over there, it's half of half a lambda is L. Here, one and a half lambdas is L, and there, are two lambdas is L. They're all lengths, but there's a different number. Of uh, wavelengths in that give fixed distance. Okay. Now, this next slide is going to be sort of a pretty picture. I th yes. Uh, this is showing interference and diffraction when you have two sources and they look like they're probably the same frequency. Okay. Now, here. This is a really messy diagram. That's a picture of what's happening. Really, the diagram, let's look at it first. This wave is sending out a pulse, okay? Now, the distance between here and here is one wavelength. One wavelength. It's just a very regular pulse. This is one wavelength. They look like they're the same wavelength, so that's a very regular pulse. But you've got two different locations sending the same pulse. Now, sometimes... Those two waves, the pulse constructively interfere. In other words, this one is on top of that one. So you have a node here and another one here and another one here. And that's what makes the dark looking rays coming here. There's nothing really there. It's just those are the places where you have constructive interference. And you would call those the nodes. And these are the lines of the nodes. And that's the the rays you see coming out here, okay? Now again, that's interference of waves from two sources. The waves combine to form a larger wave where the two wave crests cross each other and they cancel out each other where the trough and the crest meet like right in between here. See, here's the crest on this one is right at the trough between those two. So here you have destructive interference here, constructive interference there. And you'll get something that sounds like pulses there, okay? I may have said it wrong. I think I did. These are your nodes where they constructively interfere. This is the 
the places where they uh, destructively interfere. That's why they're murky looking, because they've wiped each other out. That's why these are so bright, because that's the, because you see this one is this way, this one is that way. So I pointed wrong. These are the places for destructive interference. Okay. All right. Again, don't worry about that too much. But that's what we mean by interference. Interference from two ways, from two sources. When they combine together, they uh, where they cross each other, and that's your nodes. And then in the places where they cancel each other out, uh, that's where the wave crests and the trough combine on each other. Now, they have a little activity there of two boys, looks like, doing spring uh, string and you know doing up or down with it and if you wanted to play with that you could but i'm not going to now there's another property of waves that's called diffraction and let's see if they have a picture of that they sort of do i think yeah sort of do it's not a particularly great picture but it is a picture it's where a wave bends and usually the bending of a wave, diffraction is a property of a wave that describes its ability to bend around obstacles in its path. Okay, so let me write that down. Diffraction uh, is a property of a wave that describes describes its ability, I don't want to write all that word by will, I guess, that describes its ability to bend around an obstacle. I can't spell. Okay. Okay. I'll just leave it like that. Okay. Now, well, I just messed it up. Remember, it did this last time, but I just messed it. I was just going to say, remember how last time it kept flicking on and off? We haven't had any of that tonight, and then it just did it. Uh, I'm using the same cord, same computer, same everything, but last time, uh, last Tuesday, it was going crazy. This time it's doing better. So, here is an example of diffraction. You can think of this as a jetty or something like this at the beach. And the waves come in pretty parallel to each other, but these on the side get stopped by the jetty. The ones in the middle don't get stopped, but then they get bent. So now you have a bent wave coming out. And I don't know if you've ever been to Splash Adventure, have you? You have. Don't they have the wave generators? Yeah, okay. There's another one up in Huntsville, I can't or somewhere up Decatur. north. Huh? Decatur. What's that called? Uh, um. And then my mother in law takes the grandkids there a lot. I know it's in Decatur. Yeah, I know what you, yeah. They, she took, uh, they, she's from Huntsville, and she takes them over there, and they have a blast over there. But that's what they're doing. They're using things to create the waves and make it look like a surf or whatever. Uh, actually, when we were in Munich, Germany, uh, there's a stream that flows under their park that's called English Gardens, and there's one place where it's exposed and it makes such big waves that people surf on those waves <laughs> because of the way they they didn't do it on purpose, but it they made a, a great wave pool, pool there. All right, that pretty much, and they show here some of the uh, creating these waves using the different uh, jetties and things like that. Okay, ah, here she is. Perfect attendance again tonight. Okay. I think I announced last week about the student course evaluations. Yeah. Okay, good deal. I thought so. Okay. So, perfect attendance, way to go, folks. That means all week we had perfect attendance. That's wonderful. Okay. Yeah. I, I figured you'd be here if you could. All right. 
We just finished 16.1 when we were talking about waves, various just words. You know, nothing here, no problems to solve. We did do one example uh, with uh, velocity, wave velocity, frequency, and period. We will do more, I promise you. So, oh, and here's another picture of that uh, diffraction. Okay, this is actually, it may not be a real picture, but you can see the water waves coming in close to being parallel, but then you have the jetties there that are blocking things, and then inside you get the uh, sort of semicircular type waves. That's diffraction, the bending of a wave, okay? Uh, entering, they say, through a door or water passing through a small opening, okay? What's that? What's that look like? When they um, bring those um, those air mattress tubs uh -huh. and try to sell, and they show the bend in uh, how oh. it's supposed to wave something and stuff. That's what it looks like. Okay. Is that to get all the air out of them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Here's another, and I haven't quite figured out this one. Uh, I guess this is a fake one, and what they do, they pump the water out from there. There's a perfect, protective fence to keep people from getting sucked into it, but they pump the water here, generate the waves, and then they let them disperse like this, and the people ride the waves. Uh, and maybe they'll show that. Yeah, here's the people trying to body surf on the waves. Boy, as hot as it was today, that's making me feel like I want to be there. <laughs> huh? Yeah, uh, I left all the windows up in my car because it looked like it might start raining. So, oh, it was okay. I'm glad I left the windows up. Yeah. All right. So now we're ready for electromagnetic waves. Now, yeah, I can write some on here. What is an electromagnetic wave? An electromagnetic wave is a transverse wave. Now, it's not a transverse wave exactly like your hose on the ground, but it's sort of like that. What, what is happening there is the motion. It's a field. That's the best way to describe it, a field. You have an electric field, and you have a magnetic field, and they're going perpendicular to each other. Uh, oh, I can't do it right. Okay. <laughs> this one's going up and down, this one's going left and right. I get crossed up trying to do that, okay? And so that's why it's a transverse wave. The motion is like this, but the transmission is like that. The electric uh, electric field's doing this, the, the magnetic field's doing this, yeah, okay? And the motion is going like that, okay? So it's a transverse wave resulting from periodic disturbance in an electromagnetic field, okay? No particles are changing. The field is being disturbed. Transverse wave resulting from disturb a periodic disturbance Okay, in an electromagnetic field. And I'm going for shorthand put EM, electromagnetic field. Okay, EM, electromagnetic, EM, electromagnetic field. That's what my abbreviation is. Now, here's a real key to all electromagnetic radiation. Catch this, they all travel at the same speed. And that speed is the speed of light. So the V for electromagnetic radiation is always the constant C, the speed of light, and that is 3.00 times 10 to the eighth 
meters per second. Okay? Now, let me tell you, that is fast. Just to give you an idea of how fast this is. I don't know if you even have a good concept of how big the world is. It's huge. Right? So around the equator, that's the biggest circle around the globe, right? Of this huge planet that we're on. If you were traveling at the speed of light, you could go around the whole Earth four and a half times or something like that in a single second. That's how fast the speed of light is. That's why when you turn on the light, they look like they come on instantaneously. They don't, but they're traveling at four and a half times around the globe in a single second. That's really fast. You can't detect the difference there, okay? So it's very, 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 very fast. To give it in terms that we might understand a little bit better, 186 thousand miles per second okay 186,000 miles per second that is fast okay but have you ever noticed when someone is interviewing someone say on the other side of the world uh, in a live interview there's always a pause between when the first person asks the question and the other person answers it it's not that they're just stopping to think. It's because you see that electromagnetic signal has to go up and hit a satellite somewhere way above the Earth, come back down and be translated there. And then that's what the person hears. And then when they respond, it has to go back up and come back down again. That's why there's a delay, because it's going more than one circumference of the Earth. Uh, it's taking a few seconds for that, those responses to be made. Now remember our formula before? For any wave, V is equal to lambda times the frequency. Lambda is a wavelength. Frequency is the uh, cycles per second. Now we can just say for all electromagnetic waves, C is equal to lambda F. You don't need to know the velocity. You always know the velocity. The velocity of all electromagnetic radiation is the speed of light. Okay? Now, because of that, we now have a relationship here that we can show. Uh, and we can, by the way, write the same formula at least two different ways. One of these is this. Lambda is equal to C over F, or the other one is F is equal to C over Lambda. Back with our circles or triangles like we did before, this one works perfectly with that. So frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength, or the wavelength is equal to the speed of light divided by the frequency. Okay. Now, because the velocity is always the same, we can have this pretty impressive looking uh, spectrum, we might call it. Let's start back down here at very low frequencies. Very low frequency. F is low frequencies up to high frequency. Now, it may not sound like it low, but this would be 10 to the fourth uh, cycles per second. That's pretty. That's 10,000 cycles per second, okay? That would be 10 kilohertz, okay? That's where we start here, 10 kilohertz, okay? Now, that's below your broadcast band for uh, radio waves. I mean, some radio waves are down there, but it's smaller than the AM, shorter than the AM, okay? These are, and, and I'm going to say something else here that's really, it's true, it's not too important to what we're doing now, but it sort of is. The higher the frequency, the higher the energy of the wave. Okay? So, catch that. The speed's always the same, speed of light, but the higher the frequency is the higher energy. So, waves down here, they're not going to hurt you at all. In fact, do you think there's any electromagnetic radiation in this room? 
What you think? Do I need ever getting sick or anything because of it? No. Okay. What electromagnetic radiation might there be in this room? The light. Light is electromagnetic radiation. Traveling at the speed of light. Okay, that's why they call it the speed of light. And that's not hurting us, is it? Okay. If you had a radio, in fact, maybe some of your computers have on it, you could tune that radio, and I bet you you could probably pick up easily 40 or 50 stations, don't you think? Well, every one of those is sending out a radio signal. So there's electromagnetic radiation all over in this room. Just tune your radio. You're not moving. That radio is just going, picking up all those different signals. They're all out there, and we're just picking them up if you tune your radio for it, okay? So down here we call broadband, broadcast band, that's AM radio. These are what we call shortwave radio. Y'all remember back in the day when CBs were pretty popular? Yeah. What was it? Uh, they had some phrase they said in it. I can't remember what it was now. Huh? Yeah, 10 4 good buddy, that kind of stuff. Uh, there was something they said at the beginning. I don't remember what it was. Then your FM and your TV bands are up here in the, this is in the megahertz range. That's the kilohertz down there, megahertz here. Microwaves are up here. They call them micro. You might think they're very short. They are fairly short, but they're not nearly as short as these are. So those are your microwaves. Then your infrared, which is basically heat radiation, that's here. And the visible light spectrum, the light that comes from the sun. Now, the sun is sending forth electromagnetic radiation in enormous quantities. Enormous quantities. This down here is not har harmful at all. This up here is deadly. Deadly, okay? Because it's very high energy at very high frequency. These rays will kill you. Not immediately. They will make you very, very sick, and then you die. You remember... There was some spy who defected, and the Russians poisoned him with electromagnetic radiation with a, an isotope. And boy, his death was long, not super long, but incredibly painful because he was being destroyed from the inside out because they fed him the uh, radioactive material. It's deadly stuff. Uh, people who are exposed to nuclear uh, things that go wrong. Uh, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, you know, when they've had these things. Or Hiroshima and Nagasaki when we dropped the bombs. Those people, some of them died immediately because of the heat and the blast. Some of them died very slowly because of radiation poisoning. And some of them are still being affected by the residual radiation. It's not anything to mess with. High energy up here. The sun's putting out all that energy over the entire spectrum. Fortunately, we have on our planet an atmosphere covering us. And that atmosphere basically doesn't allow this low energy radiation even to come through. Maybe a little bit come through, but not much. And it blocks the high energy radiation. It only lets this little bitty spectrum come through here, and we call that visible light. That's all we get from the sun. Now, that's not quite true. A little bit of this ultraviolet sneaks through. And that's what gives us skin cancers, cataracts, wrinkles. <laughs> you know, the more you're exposed to the sun, the more your skin deteriorates, okay? And other things about, like your eyes and things do. That's why I've had two cataracts re replaced now uh, because I was exposed to too much ultraviolet radiation when I was young, probably. But in time, everybody's going to have them, you know. X-rays are really high power. Now, those are pretty beneficial things, but that very short doses and very quick, and it's over with, right? And you don't go back for more. And that's why those x-ray technicians, do they stay in the room when they turn on the x-ray? No. They go into this little room, and it has a really thick wall, 
that wall is filled with lead to keep the radiation from coming through. The glass they look through is a dark gray glass because it's got lead in it. It keeps the radiation. But they're all wearing badges of some nature, and that it, it registers if they're exposed to too much radiation, then they may have to go home before the month's over with because they've already been exposed to too much. It's dangerous stuff. Not bad when you just have your mouth x-rayed or a bone x-rayed. It's just a real short burst. Yeah, you, your body can take care of that. But if you had long exposure to it, it's going to get you. Just like long exposure to ultraviolet, it's going to kill skin cells, cause cancers, okay? Uh, melanoma or basal cell or whatever. Now, notice here the relationship. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. Remember, C is equal to lambda F. The relationship between lambda and F is an inverse relationship. If the frequency goes up, the wavelength goes down. If the frequency goes down, the wavelength goes up. So down there you have very long waves, like 30,000 meters in length. Okay, Down here you have 3... Goodness gracious, I can't even think what that, nanometers, okay? Really small wavelength down here, very long wavelengths down there, okay? Radio waves are long wavelength. Have you ever seen those radio antennas and the TV antennas? They go way up there because they're long wavelength, long, yeah, wavelength, low frequency, relatively low frequency. Speed of light is pretty large number, so it makes for a big band. Thank you, atmosphere. You only allow that good old visible light to come through, and that's what the plants use to make sugars, to make fruit, to make vegetables, to make everything else, that visible light spectrum. Most of the ultraviolet is blocked, most of the infrared. Now, get this, though. When that visible light comes through our atmosphere, our atmosphere... It doesn't slow it down, but it lengthens the wavelength because it's having interference there. There's friction there, okay? And when it does that, it loses frequency, lengthens the wavelength, and it becomes infrared, which is heat. And that's why if you leave your windows rolled up in your car on a bright sunny day, even in the middle of wintertime, that car inside is warm, this time of year, it's burning up hot. That's why you don't leave pets or children in a closed car in a parking lot. Because they can die fairly quickly. Because there's too much heat there. That's because the visible light coming through the glass lengthens its wavelength and becomes heat energy. Infrared. And that's what our, black, our, uh, our atmosphere does for us. That comes in and warms up. And that's what's called... The greenhouse effect. That's what your car does. That's what a greenhouse does. The light comes in, heats the inside, but the infrared energy can't escape because it's too long of a wavelength, too low of an energy. Okay. Now. Oh, I'm sorry. I almost missed the first example. Uh... I got to talk about electromagnetic spectrum. Let's back up. I think we're going to have to go back to my clean sheet. Okay. All right. Example one, top of page three, I mean 434. The FM band on a radio is centered around the frequency of 100 megahertz. And they said that's the frequency. The symbol for frequency is? Y'all know that. Symbol for frequency? F. F equal 100 megahertz. M-H-Z. Now what does the prefix mega stand for? Million. Million. 100 million hertz okay 
Now, the easier way to write that would be 1 100 times 10 to the 6, because you got six zeros there, 10 to the 6 hertz. Or you could do 1 times 10 to the 8, whatever you want to do. But that zero is significant. Okay? Megahertz. Find the length of an FM antenna if each arm must be a quarter of a wavelength. So here you got an antenna, and each arm is going to be one quarter of lambda. One quarter of a wavelength. I can't write, okay? Now, what you're looking for, you've got to find the wavelength. Okay, this is electromagnetic radiation. So what's your formula that relates frequency and wavelength? What you're looking for is lambda. We don't know what that is. What formula relates frequency and wavelength in the electromagnetic radiation? There were three of them, remember? I had the other thing up there. It's already erased them. What's that? Frequency. The what? C. C? Is that what you said? That's the speed of light. Okay, so C is equal to the speed of light. That is the velocity. And that is... 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. I want to make sure I got that right. 10 to the 8th meters per second. That's a fix. That's a constant. Okay? So what relates the velocity, C, frequency, and lambda? What formula? We've had it a couple times now. Say again? It relates lambda to, yeah. What is it? What's the formula? In any one of its three forms, it'll work. Okay, let's see if that's right. Lambda is equal to C over F. Uh, F, sorry. Is, yeah, that's exactly right, because C is equal to lambda times F, okay? My writing is lousy, okay? So, C is 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, divided by the frequency was 100 times 10 to the... 6 m meters, no, per second, so I'm sorry. Hertz is per seconds, so that's per seconds, 1 over second, okay? Now, I said you could write that a different way. Let's write it as 1.00 times 10 to the, move it two more places, so increase that by 2, by 8 per seconds. That makes this a very easy calculation to do because the 10 to the 8th go out and 3 divided by 1 is 3.00 meters because the per seconds go out and you're just left with meters. So that lambda is 3 meters long. That's about the height of this wall here because I'm about 2 meters tall. Okay. And couldn't you put at least a half person me above that? Okay, so that would be about three meters. It's probably a little taller than three meters. I'm guessing it's a ten foot ceiling, uh, but that's close to three meters. So lambda is three meters. Well, we know that the arm is a quarter of a lambda, so that would be three fourths of a meter, right? which would mean, no, I'm sorry, what am I saying? Yeah, this is equal to 1 lambda 
and lambda divided by 4 would be 3 divided by 4. So this would be 0 0.75 meters. It would be how long each of those would be. And it's 750 because there were three significant digits here, three significant digits there, three significant digits there, three significant digits everywhere. So 0 0.750 meters. Does that make sense? Now, let's just go back and look. If this is making sense, can I erase it? Y'all, No, y'all still writing? You're good? Okay. So let me erase it, and let's see if that made sense. Uh, go back here to that last one we were looking at. Current slide, and we said it was FM radio signal, and it said find the lambda, the wavelength of lambda, and we said three meters. Let's see. Ah, there was three meters, and look at that. Yep, that's right in the FM radio band, right around the same as the television band. Okay, good deal. That finishes 16.2. Now, we only did one example in 16.2. We did one example in 16.1. Uh, no. Yeah, one example in 16.1 and one example in 16.2. And yet, they have 17 problems for you at the end of the chapter, end of the section. So do any of the odds, um, I'd say 1 through 17, okay? Do some of each type so you can uh, understand and, uh, and follow what's going on there, okay? That's 16.2. Whoa, goodness, look at how the time is flowing. Let's move on to 16.3. This is getting very much closer to what you need to, to know. I think I'm going to have to leave the slide and go to this one so we can uh, write down some of the information. 16.3 is dealing with sound waves. Now, I've been talking about sound the whole time, but here we're going to formally talk about it. Sound refers to those waves transmitted through a medium with frequencies capable of being detected by the human ear and produced with a vibrating source, uh, something like a ringing bell a, a thing. So sound is waves. Whoa, let me get my pen back. Okay. And I want to also say... Uh, longitudinal waves or pressure waves. Okay. Uh, transmitted through a medium Now most of the time it's going through air. But have you ever been to the swimming pool and been underwater? You can hear things really distinctly underwater. I don't know if any of you ever watched those cowboy and Indian movies on television and or the cops and robbers or whichever ones they were. Uh, and if they wanted to know when the train was coming, they put their ear down to the track. You wouldn't hear the train through the air, but you could hear it through the metal because solids transmit sound better than air does, and better than liquids. Liquids transmit sound better than water, uh, than, than uh, air. And that's why your body, you can do sonography, because the body transmits sound pretty good. However, bones don't transmit it too well, okay? Uh, I'm going to give sort of this dumb story. Uh, way back... I don't remember how many years ago, probably close to 20 years ago, I had changed my insurance plan to a company. You know, I was working at Southern Research then, uh, and they had a company that offered better 
coverage than what I was getting. So I changed company, uh, but I had to change doctors. So I chose a doctor who worked out of uh, St. Vincent's. Yeah. He was a young doctor. I didn't know that at the time, very young. I didn't know that at the time. I just picked his name out because he was taking patients. So I picked him out and got him. I found out he was a very nervous doctor. He worried about everything. And one of my visits to him, he thought he saw microscopic amounts of blood in my urine. So he was convinced I must have bladder cancer. Okay, it's kind of like my mom. My mom was a registered nurse, and she, if one of us got sick, she could find the most deadly disease that fit that symptom of anything out there. She worried about, you know, excuse me. So anyway, this doctor was convinced that I might have bladder cancer, so he sent me in to get ultrasound. Okay? No, I think it was worse than that. He was going to do something else, and my wife said, nope go get an ultrasound. And that's what we wound up doing. Okay? Now, that technician, I remember, and I was really fortunate I had such a nervous doctor. I didn't have anything wrong with my bladder. In fact, as she said, you know, be sure to come in with a full bladder so we'll be able to see everything. And they made you drink stuff that would make okay. things show better. So I was there pretty much suffering in the bladder. She said, she said, wow, you really do have a full bladder. Uh, and she said, well, let me look around. And it was perfectly fine. Okay. But she kept looking around with her, I say looking around, listening around with the ultrasound, but seeing the image. So it was looking around. And she said, it looked like I had something cloudy looking around one of my kidneys. She said it may be just something like gas or something else, but she couldn't tell with ultrasound. So they scheduled me to have a, uh, another test, and sure enough, I turned out I had a angiomyolipoma, lipoma, which is angio is blood, myo is muscle, and lipo, lipo is fat, fatty tissue, just some sort of a tissue around my kidney. In fact, a whole bunch of them, the little nodules. Sometimes you'll have these places on your arm or something. You can feel them wobble around in there. Your dog or cat may have these things. Little fatty things there. And I have one right there. I have one right there. That's not as much fatty. But, you know, you have not no all that normal to have them around the kidney, though. And, unfortunately, one of those was pretty good size. And the urologist I was seeing said, you know, we probably need to get that one out of there because it could rupture. And if it ruptured, you could bleed to death before they'd ever know what was wrong, you know, and uh, internally. So I had to have kidney surgery. So thank goodness I did have that nervous little doctor. What he was worried about wasn't at all it, but that lady with the ultrasound kept looking around and then see, saw something that said, looked suspicious. They sent me to somewhere else, and sure enough, they found that and took it out okay i had to take half my kidney too but that's all right you want to leave as much kidney as possible had a really good urologist so anyway that's what sound is it travels through a medium that could be your body but it doesn't travel through things at the same way so it reflected off that tumor that that cyst or whatever was in there and she could see that okay now we talked about the speed of light. The speed of sound has a very special value as well. However, it varies. It varies with several things, the main thing being temperature. But the other thing is also the medium. It travels faster through metal than it does through air. It travels faster through water than it does through air slower through water than it does through metal. So it has a variation there. So let's go back. No, let's go on and get this here. The speed of sound Okay. The speed of sound in dry air at 
one atmosphere of pressure okay at zero degrees Celsius that's cold that's the freezing point is uh, 331 meters per second okay that's what we sort of use as normal though that's a bit on the dry I mean on the cool side of normal now remember the speed of sound then is the speed of light C 300 million meters per second is there any surprise that you always see lightning before you hear thunder because light travels way 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 faster than sound does okay in fact if you did you go see fireworks on the 4th of July okay I didn't either but if you were there, you might, or if you were far, far away away, and that's usually where I watch them, I don't go and pay for them, but I'll watch them from somewhere else. You'll see it go up, and then you'll hear the boom a few seconds later. That's because the speed of light is really, 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 really fast. The speed of sound is much, much slower. Okay? Now, notice that was dry air at zero degrees Celsius. There is a formula that tells you how to adjust for that. Okay? The speed at some other temperature would be your 331 meters per second plus 0 0.61 meter per second increase for every degree Celsius that you go up. So then you would multiply this by the temperature, Celsius temperature. Now most of the world uses Celsius, we don't. We use Fahrenheit. So in Fahrenheit, you have, on the US customary system, we don't use meters per second, we use feet per second. And that would be 10, 1087 feet per second, that's the speed of light in, in dry air at, zero, at 32 degrees Celsius, uh, Fahrenheit, okay, plus 1.1 feet per second per degree Fahrenheit times your temperature in Fahrenheit, but not just temperature and, temperature and Fahrenheit minus 32 because you have to go 32, you know, how many degrees above freezing you are. See, Celsius, zero Celsius is freezing. Freezing. 32 <laughs> Fahrenheit is freezing, so you have to make that conversion. So those are the two formulas that we use to adjust the speed of sound in air at different temperatures. Uh, and T is the air temperature uh, if you're using the upper equation, you use degrees Celsius. The lower equation, you use the degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Now, do you think we have time for example one or not? Say again? Probably not. Okay, so we'll start next time with example one. Okay, and since we didn't do any examples in this section, there won't be any new homework at uh, assignment in this section, but we will have some more next time. So we started in 6.1 today and went through 6.3. 6.3 is very short, but there are several examples. 6.4 uh, is fairly short, and there are a bunch of problems with that. Resonance, that's the last one. So we might actually finish the chapter next Tuesday, but if not, we'll probably finish it by Thursday. Okay, there will be chapter 16 tests, then we'll get into electricity and magnetism. I don't remember which order. I think electricity first. So we'll do have that one, and then it depends on whether we run out of term before we get to magnetism or not. But if we have time, we'll do one on magnetism. Because I got a term on weekend before August the 1st. 
Oh yeah, you'll have plenty of time for that, I think. Because uh, the last test will be, and even if you uh, need it, you can borrow my book or something like that. We'll, we'll make some way. I don't think you'll need it much past that. The last test, I'll give you your last day of class, and then you have to turn it in uh, just sometime that week. And if you need to borrow a book, you can. Yeah, we'll, we'll work that out. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Don't let that happen. We'll get you a book. Okay. If you need it. All right. Good deal. Have a good weekend. Uh, everybody did get a copy of the last test. Okay. And we'll be, uh, like I say, we'll finish Chapter 16 either Tuesday or Thursday of next week, I think. We'll see. All right. Remember to do, if you haven't already, do the student course event.